Daddy, when are you going to die? We're going through that stage in our family at the moment where our kids are getting very into death. They're suddenly getting very interested in death. They want to know what happens to bodies after life. They want to know what's going to happen to me after my life. They want to know when it's going to happen, when they're going to die. They want to know all these things. They're at this kind of sweet spot. The sweet spot before the, before the taboo has kicked in, before the death taboo has kind of kicked in. And I suppose I'm not, I'm not massively sure. What, you don't get training in this sort of thing, how honest you should be. Whether, you know, we can... I don't know, the old line, you pedal, oh, it won't be for a long time. I won't die for a long time. So I started thinking about this. I started thinking about, actually, what is a potential answer? And I came across something called the Gompertz Makem, Rule of Human Mortality. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about this graph, but essentially, you, you can spot the trend, so there's no problems there. It's actually, it's actually worse than that, because this is a, a logarithmic scale on the y-axis, so in reality, it basically looks like that. Uh, the take-home message. <laughs> you can read that any way you want. Um, <laughs> the take-home message, genuinely the take-home message, it, it's shocking. It's kind of, it's called, yeah, Gompets make a rule of human mortality. You reach the age of 30, about 35, um, and every eight years, your chances of dying doubles. So it's, I know, it's like, wow. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm 35 this year, so I'm now, you know, entering the upper stages of this graph. Uh, and maybe that's why I've got a cough. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, it's very, very interesting. I mean, technically, I, when you look at a graph like that, you realise that uh, we can say that to children. Yes, we won't die for a long time, but statistically, that's not right. You know, technically, all of us could die, well, yeah, we could die next year, next week, next 10 years. We all have that kind of statistical probability of death kind of hanging over us. Now, as you heard, animals is kind of my interest. Um, so I, I spent quite a long time, far too long, uh, investigating whether or not this compared to make and rule of human mortality, whether or not that applies to other animals, whether every animal has a, you know, a statistical probability of living or dying sort of flashing over their head. So I uh, spent quite a long time investigating the, you know, the tree of life, um, looking at how different animals um, respond, I suppose, to death and whether, like I say, this rule applies. And on the whole, it won't surprise you that, yes, most animals have a kind of probability of death hanging over their head. And if that animal happens to live in a, an environment where there's a high chance of death, for instance, if basically if you're an insect, a high chance that you're going to get eaten, very high chance. You'd be lucky, most insects are lucky to make it past a year. If you live in environments of death, you invest quite heavily in sperm and eggs. You invest very heavily in just getting the business done as quickly as possible. And you notice with many of these animals, they're quite cheap to build, so they just fall over and die often um, afterwards. Interestingly, you, that pattern hold, that kind of holds for mammals as well. So if you think about even something like a rat or a mouse, uh, small animals, the, uh, quite a high probability of rats and mice getting eaten or getting various diseases. So we see the same pattern. You see natural selection, uh, I suppose, chiseling um, the right life history for the job. You see that quite a lot. You see, uh, yeah, animals being chiseled, I suppose. Right, now, the interesting thing is, whilst doing this research, I, um, I came across a little clutch of animals that just throw caution to the wind. They just seem to age in a completely different way to, um, to other animals. And this talk is just a brief overview for you of the weird and wonderful and completely, at times, ridiculous ways in which animals um, age. I've got something, <laughs> something in my pocket. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm starting to get, now I'm 35, I'm starting to uh, get into collecting things. And I have a very small uh, collection of, um, of Victorian microscope slides. And I try and entertain people with them. It never works because they're possible. Anyway, I'm going to show you uh, quite a strange um, animal. I've got a photo I took with a microscope earlier on today of this animal. So this is the one that's in my hand. It's uh, called a hydra. And many of you know, perhaps might have come across hydra. It's quite a common animal. It lives in ponds and rivers. 
It's basically like a, <laughs> I know that photo makes it look like not an animal, but um, it's very much like, it. you can think of it as a freshwater sea anemone kind of creature. Quite simple. Um, okay, it clearly it used to be collected 150 years ago by uh, a Victorian naturalist in uh, Birmingham. Here's the weird thing, okay, that animal looks clearly definitely dead. Definitely dead. 150 years it's been stuck in this microscope slide. But it's not dead. It's not dead. It's not dead. And the reason it's not dead is because it is still alive in a pond in Birmingham. This animal, you might have heard of some animals doing this thing called budding, which is basically when you produce uh, an identical clone um, of yourself that it then splits off from you and then sort of does its thing and continues on. So yes, this particular clump of cells is dead, but the animal is living on. It's the uh, exact DNA a individual. The individual lives on, probably in that pond in, in Birmingham. I haven't checked, but I'm <laughs> pretty sure it lives on in the pond in, in Birmingham. How does it do it? It has special, uh, well, it has an infinite capacity for stem cell renewal. In other words, the cells that guide the, the, uh, the replication of those first cells, they can carry on going forever. Our stem cells don't do that. Nearly every other animal doesn't have stem cells that can do that. So you're looking at a very simple animal with the potential for proper immortality, I suppose. And that's just one. There's a whole bunch of other quite unusual animals. I'm getting quite, there's a type of worm, it's like a, it's a classic lab worm uh, called C. elegans. Um, and again, some of you might have heard of this research. If you, if you were so inclined to keep one of these, they're only tiny, and you were so inclined to starve one of these worms, you'll notice that they change their life history midway through growth. So they start growing normally, and then some, some sort of genetic machinery, you could say, inside the body goes, whoa, 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 let's slow down aging, we're not getting enough food, no chance of sex right now in the middle of this famine, drought thing, let's hold back on everything and then invest in sex a bit later on. So, the I mean, they don't get the diseases of old age, basically. And don't ask me about the diseases of old age and worms, but actually, they, many animals, you see the same patterns of aging. So another animal that has potentially the ability to alter its aging midway through its life, and again, these <laughs> with birds, I mean, any time you, you look at a bird, you're looking at an animal that shouldn't really um, exist, <laughs> to be brutal about it. Uh, birds, um, birds age differently to most similar sized, uh, a similar sized mammal. So uh, one of the classic ideas for why we age is that we get these pesky things called free radicals. Basically, if you're a, a bony animal like us, you base your metabolism on oxygen, you're onto a bad thing, because oxygen is quite highly reactive. And one of those reactive kind of pesky atoms are, are called free radicals. So the idea is that as you age, as you grow, you uh, essentially get like a kind of filling up with free radicals, and we call that filling up aging. So that's one of the, there's a few ideas for why we age. That's one of the main ones. Basically, the more oxygen you take in, the more your body is aging, I suppose, as a result. So these animals, pigeons, they take in three times more oxygen than a similar sized mammal, like a rat. But they don't seem to, they don't seem bothered by it. In fact, they have 10% of the free radical buildup that a rat has. So. Somehow, and I think scientists studying these animals are trying to work this out, somehow they are uh, taming their free radicals. They're not seeing the same build-up. They're not aging the same way. As you, got, you, know, you know, pigeons, lucky pigeons, might live 10, 15 years. You know, a rat might live, well, lucky to live two or three. So birds are kind of a, an enigma, I suppose. They are real, you know, real examples of an animal that somehow, uh, through natural selection, we think, you know, they've tamed those damaging free radicals. And free radicals comes up quite a bit. One of my, uh, <laughs> a bit like the microscope size, when I talk about this, most people glaze over. But last year I held a clam, and it was a clam that was 507 years old um, when it died. It's the longest living animal that we found, that scientists have found so far. 507 years. How does it do it? It makes use of this amazing ability to sort of limit the free radical damage uh, in itself. So as, as I studied death, <laughs> I was getting more and more um, amazing examples of what natural selection can act on when it comes to aging and death. Naked mole rats. Have you all heard of naked mole rats? Yeah. 
I almost put a picture in of a real life naked mole rat, but I think some of you will be like, because they look very like genitalia, I would say. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they are, well, they look quite, uh, oh no, uh, they look quite, um, <laughs> they look quite uh, sort of baggy, is that the right word? And the reason for that is they are riddled with free radicals. This, these animals, instead of dying after three years, they can live 30 years. And they look haggard and aged because they are. They're riddled with free radical damage. And for some reason, it doesn't seem to affect them in the least. And, and they don't get cancer either, which is a complete... Scientists are still looking at the strange pro, uh, proteins in its blood and trying to work out, are these weird proteins to do with the fact this animal genuinely seems to be one of only, a, possibly the only, large multicellular creature that doesn't get cancer. So it's very interesting, very, very interesting to me. Hands up if you've heard of the immortal jellyfish. The immortal jellyfish, oh, that's encouraging. Um, yeah, the, the immortal jellyfish is probably the only animal to, uh, the only jellyfish certainly that gets to spawning time. Normally jellyfish produce sperm and eggs and just die. And then f we're not quite sure why. Uh, only s one single species of jellyfish doesn't do that. It produces eggs and sperm. All of the other jellyfish are dying around it and then it just sort of, goes back into a weird jellyfish version of a larvae and then starts up the process again. So it reverses that. It doesn't just last forever, it reverses ages. So, <laughs> you know, the, one of the reasons nature's great is because it comes up with all sorts of strange things like this. This is probably today's favorite animal for me. And it's uh, a pearl mussel. Uh, I told you I like clams. Um, a pearl mussel, this is a single pearl mussel that can do something extraordinary. Its larvae, so the little babies, if you like, of this mussel, uh, are free swimming. They swim into the gills of fish, and they live on the gills of fish. They parasitize fish. But they do something incredible. When they swim, they land on the fish, and the first thing they do in their new home, these larvae inject a special uh, peptide, a special protein, that makes the fish deal with its free radicals better, so the fish is less likely to die whilst it's hosting the parasite. <laughs> so the fish live up to a year or two longer. They, the fish then don't get cancer. The fish then don't get the classic diseases of old age. Now I do know the old diseases of old age in fish, and it's cataracts, just like it is for us. So they don't get cataracts. They, the parasite is, is giving its host uh, life. It's really weird. We think of parasites as being horrible things, but a fantastic example of an animal that is extending the life of its host. But you can see where I'm going with this. I mean, like, some of you must have thought it. You must have thought, well, hang on, what if, what if we could just snuff one of those larvae? Because <laughs> I know I have, <laughs> especially today. Um, yeah, uh, the more I came across animals like this, the more I realized I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone in um, having an interest in animals like this. You know, there's a global industry at the moment. It's a a boom area in science is studying the animals that potentially uh, oh, I don't know, we can kind of monetize aging we can give people what they've always wanted there is one quick anecdote I'm going to tell you some of you might need a bit of convincing here uh, it's an anecdote that comes through um, Nick Lane's brilliant books um, and it's about scientists called uh, Manasha Tanaka in Japan um, now, this is, this is quite a staggering example of the impact that f manipulating free radicals could have. Okay, in Japan, there is a subset of the population, very small part of the population in Japan, um, who has a single base pair difference in their DNA. That single base pair difference affects their ability to um, deal with free radicals. And as it happens, it makes them deal with free radicals slightly better. So this one base pair change, this one base pair difference in this small subset of the Japanese population means that they're twice as likely to live to 100. But this is the most amazing thing. One base pair difference, and they're half as likely to visit hospital for any reason at all for their whole life. For their whole life. So the power of... The, the potential, if you like, for getting... I mean, look at this graph. Do you remember this graph? Obviously, of course you do. It's probably still ingrained in your head. It's on your eyelids. Imagine if, if you could push, you could squash aside that graph. You could force the diseases of old age 
classic diseases like hypertension, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, cancer. You could force those diseases right to the end of life. We talk so much about the, the, our beleaguered health system. You know, the, the NHS is, 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 we're constantly being reminded of the problems it's having and it's going to have in future. You can see the market here. You can see the application and it is kind of st staggering, I suppose. I don't quite know how I feel about it. I'm, I'm naturally, as you, as you can probably tell, I'm fairly sort of an anxious person and, and uh, naturally a little bit scared of things. I'm kind of scared of this idea of potentially of us, pay, some people who can afford it, paying for extended lives. I haven't got a pension yet. I don't want to have to pay with, through my work for the pensions of the super rich who are living extra. We talked about con uh, consumption you know, earlier on today. You live 30% longer. Imagine that consumption, that cumulative consumption that humans will throw at uh, the environment. And yet, we're not really talking about it. I just found it absolutely fantastic, I suppose. One thing I am sure of is that this is the latest in a long line of human obsessions with immortality. <laughs> you know, we have uh, all, ne uh, nearly all human cultures seem to have, uh, you know, this, this, this um, I don't know if it's a societal need or a human need to push the boundaries and really feel, you know, I want to live longer, I want to live forever, I want to live as long as possible. So is this just the latest uh, manifestation of our insatiable appetite for longer life? I don't know. I really, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I started this talk very hoarsely going, Daddy, <laughs> going, Daddy, when are you going to die? I think for most of us in this room, we're stuck with the Don Pert's make and rule of mortality. But her generation, I, I'm no longer sure. Thank you. <laughs>